Shovel Knight, Shovel Knight, Shovel Freaking Knight. Holy crap, does this game get praised right up the asshole. I've never seen a game get so much rim jobs from the critics. I mean, I have to try this game out if everyone's praising it like it's the damn second coming of Christ. You've probably heard the story a million times, this was a Kickstarter game, blah blah. I can understand why people, you know, keep on crapping on about it being a Kickstarter game, because it's like, you can't be a slave to a producer, you have to be a slave to the people. And to be honest, I'd rather be a slave to a producer than to, like, some dork on Kickstarter. I mean, have you seen those comments? They're so damn nitpicky. I think it would be easier just satisfying some producer than, like, a million nitpicky nerds. What a pain in the ass that would be. So this game is made by Yacht Club Games. This company was created by a guy called Sean Valesco who used to work for WayForward Technologies. If you haven't played any WayForward Technology games, then you're missing out on the good life. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit. The game's always solid, but they're not amazing. Though they make a lot of cool 2D hand-drawn platformers, so that's what I like about them. You're always gonna have a good time with them. What the fudge is a treasure trove? Well, the treasure trove pack has three games in it. The first one's called Shovel of Hope. The second is called Plague of Shadows, and the third is called Spectre of Torment. So Shovel of Hope is, you know, the original Kickstarter game that got all the praise, and then Plague of Shadows is an alternative storyline, so it, you know, it doesn't really matter because you can't have two contradictory stories. And Spectre of Torment is a prequel, which is pretty damn badass. So that's like three games in one! Wow! So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go through each game, I'm gonna go through the good, the bad, the ugly, so hold on to your butts. The first game I'll review is Shovel of Hope. The story goes that Shovel Knight and Shield Knight are kicking all manner of ass and collecting all manner of treasure. But one day, they decide to explore the Tower of Fate, how ironic and an evil cursed amulet takes Shield Knight away. And then Shovel Knight gets kicked out of the Tower of Fate and he can't do anything to rescue Shield Knight. So he decides to go all Bilbo Baggins on us. <coughs> well, not in that way, but in the way that he decides to live a life of solitude. And many years later, an evil sorcerer called Enchantress decides to take over the land. And she reopens the Tower of Fate. Shovel Knight hears of this and he decides to come out of retirement and rescue Shield Knight. So this story makes Shovel Knight sound like a selfish asshole. So the only reason he's gonna save the land is so he can get that Shield Knight pussy. The best thing about this story is that you can skip the cutscenes. I think that's a feat in and of itself. You know how many games where you can't even skip the damn cutscenes? By the year 2018, you'd think that developers would finally realise no one wants to watch their stupid cutscene. You can instantly tell which classics inspired it. The level design and boss fights are like Mega Man. The special moves remind me of the abilities you get from the Robot Masters. You have the overworld of Super Mario Bros. 3, the villagers from Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, Shovel Knight's shovel works like the pogo stick from DuckTales. There's a bit of inspiration from Castlevania too. It's a combination of classic NES games without most of the cheap garbage those titles are known for. There are no lives, thank goodness. You don't have those moments like in Mega Man where you get to the end of the stage and the boss kills you and because you had one life you have to play the whole damn level over again. There's none of that crap. However, there are a crap ton of checkpoints in each stage. Your only punishment for dying is that you lose some treasure which you can pick back up anyway. I noticed that the more treasure you have, the more you lose when you die. It puts pressure on those who are doing well. I'm guessing it's done that way so that to be rewarded with the best power-ups and gear, you have to be really good. I assume it stops the average player from finding the game too easy. At the same time, it's fair to those who are struggling. There's a big emphasis put on collecting treasure. The money you get doesn't just go towards gear and power-ups, but to your health and magic meter too. In truth, you don't really have to go out of your way that much to collect gold. The designers were smart enough not to make that a vital part of the game. You just have to do the bare minimum of treasure collecting to get through. Platforming games are all about the levels. There are some pretty uninspired themes here like snow, lava, castle, water, and haunted. This stuff's been done to death. As for the level gimmicks themselves, about half of them are pretty cool. There's this one where you hit this green sludge stuff into lava and it turns all bouncy. That was pretty damn cool. But then there's some where you're like, yeah, I've seen that done in previous games. I found that sometimes sections of a level were more difficult near the start than at the end, making the difficulty balance not always the best. There's a boss fight at the end of each stage. They aren't that hard as long as you use the right power up against them. Just like in Mega Man. 
A good thing is that there's a checkpoint right before the boss so you don't have to start the whole damn level over again. It pisses me off when games make the checkpoint far away from boss, it's just a cheap way to make things more difficult. So I have to give Yacht Club games a rim job for not falling for that trick. The enemies themselves aren't too bad, the only enemies that pissed me off were these random patterned phallic shaped flying rocket thingies. They were hard to hit and kept knocking me into pits. The thing I love about the levels is how they'll subtly teach you a new mechanic, but they don't do it in a forceful way. They do it subtly. Just how it should be. That's what I love most about old school games. They never force things, they let you figure it out on your own, and that's what this game does well. But it won't pull off this BS like you were meant to know some new mechanic out of nowhere. If they want you to learn new moves, they'll do it in an environment where the only way to get through is if you do it, but it's in a safe way where you won't get killed. The levels before facing off against Enchantress are a combination of gimmicks used from previous levels, a test of all that you've learned, which is very Mega Man like. Overall, the level design is alright. It's not super amazing like the critics make it out to be, it's not a cut above the rest, it's just alright. Outside of the stages, you can visit villages, fight random enemies on the map, do extra challenges and tasks. It's for those who want a little more, but you can totally avoid it if you want. Controls are pretty good, but for some reason they make you press up and Y to do a special move, even though they could have just used A. They finally rectify this in Spectre Knight's campaign, but it's kinda, yeah, I found it just strange. I think the reason for doing so is so that you could play the game with an NES controller, but you know, why, why, would, why the hell would you want to do that? There is one thing you should never copy from a Castlevania game. Stupid ass knockback. This is a cheap way to add difficulty. You can eventually buy armor that gets rid of the knockback, but it's just a stupid thing to have in the first place. So depending on which console you got Shovel Knight for, you get exclusive features. Sony get a Kratos boss fight, Microsoft get a battle against the freaking Battletoads. So what will Nintendo get? Will they get to shove a shovel up Mario's ass? Beat Link up into a pulp? Samus? No, frickin' Amiibos. Stupid lame ass Amiibos. Why the hell would you want that crap? Amiibos are the stupidest thing ever. We have to buy stuff to get extra content while the other companies get it for free. That's stupid. So yeah, we got gypped. Apparently the Amiibos unlock challenges, customizable gear and fairies, but I'm not paying for that crap so I'll never know what the hell it does. If you have eyes, you can tell that the graphics are in an 8-bit kind of style. They're easily better than any of the classic NES games. You know, modern technology and all. The music also goes along with that 8-bit style. Pretty damn awesome. Jake Kalkman kills it. I really need to play more of the games he composed for. The music is super catchy and it hits the fills when it needs to. My favourite is the Lost City theme. There are a couple pieces of music done by some Japanese lady. I, I don't know her name, it's very Japanesey. But she did the first Mega Man game. Her music's okay. Would I recommend Shovel Knight? Yes I would, it's a solid game. It's not like the second coming of Christ, but it's definitely worth checking out. Next up is Plague of Shadows. <laughs> The story goes that Plague Knight, who was a boss in the Shovel of Hope, wants to make the ultimate potion which grants the user whatever he wants. To do so he needs to steal all the essences from the other knights and enchantress. He does so with the help from Mona the Witch in some secret underground laboratory. So 95% of Plague of Shadows is the same as the Shovel of Hope including music. Which is pretty disappointing, the game feels exactly the same. Sure, there's slight changes in the level to accommodate for Plague Knight, but that isn't enough. The only thing going for it is that you play as Plague Knight, but he sucks ass. Like, look at this frickin' knockback. Look at this crap. Plague Knight is all about them bombs. You can throw them at your enemies, with the treasure you can buy customizations that affect the fuse lamp, explosion type and how it's thrown or used. There are green coins in the level which after collecting a certain amount you can exchange them with Mona for research to get more access to even more bomb customizations. 
There's Arcane Magic, which is similar to Shovel Knight's magic abilities, but your magic meter recovers slowly over time. If you hold the attack button, your character will charge up, which gives you a boost jump once you let go. This takes some getting used to. You have a double jump, don't get too excited. Your initial jump is pathetically tiny. The double jump is a pain in the ass because there'll be parts where you think it will work, but it ends up you needed the burst charge to make it. He also has a weird thing where he can mostly only increase his health temporarily through buying or picking up magic potions. His playstyle makes boss fights and certain enemies a lot easier, but when it comes to platforming things can get very frustrating. That extra knockback is a real killer. Would I recommend Plague of Shadows? No, it's really damn boring. He isn't fun to control, his campaign is mostly the same, it just doesn't work. The problem is, it wasn't designed with him in mind, it was designed for Shovel Knight. It's like shoving a square block into a circular hole. I give this game a meh rating. It's not broken, but it's just bland and boring. Like Kevin Costner. Now for the final part of the treasure trove, Spectre of Torment. <laughs> Spectre of Torment is a prequel. It goes over Spectre Knight's backstory of how he became what he is, and your quest to recruit a bunch of knights for Enchantress. This one has the most interesting story out of the bunch, and damn what a turnaround. This is by far the most fun out of them all. This one's like the opposite of Plague of Shadows. Now most of the stage design is completely different. There are new enemies and even new level gimmicks. The boss characters look the same, but they have different attack patterns. Spectre Knight can run up and jump off walls, he has a homing attack which is used a lot for his platforming and he can grind rails like a boss. There are red scales to collect so that you can gain new abilities. There's now like some kind of mini tutorial when you gain a new ability. Of course it lets you figure out how the ability works on your own. Money is only for upgrading your abilities and gear, the abilities in this game are so awesome. The most badass is called Judgment Rush, it makes him charge like this towards an enemy and strike them. Like Plague of Shadows, Spectre of Torment has the same music, however unlike Plague of Shadows, the music is remixed. It sounds okay I guess. The only complaint I can think of gameplay wise is that your homing attack can make you slash downwards through these hanging lamps. You never actually have to slash downward, but it still gives that option. It makes the last part of the game difficult. You have to watch which direction the slash symbol is going before you press the attack button. I thought pressing up an attack would make you slash up through hanging lamps, but you just have to wait till the slash direction symbol changes. It feels like you get a split second to react sometimes. Do I recommend? Hell yeah baby. It's what Plague of Shadows should have been. Now, do I recommend Shovel Knight Treasure Trove? So all of them put together. Initially I would have just told you to buy Shovel of Hope and Spectre of Torment and skip Plague of Shadows, but I heard that you'll get a new campaign called King of Cards, where you play as King Knight, and a 4 player battle mode for free. From what I've seen so far, King Knight looks like it will be another Spectre Knight and not a Plague Knight. So yes, I recommend Treasure Trove. There's a lot of content for cheap. I didn't mention the co-op mode and the unlockable challenge mode. There's probably even more to the game I haven't mentioned because I'm a lazy arsehole. If there's a Shovel Knight 2, I think they should make it like 16-bit style and take inspiration from Super Nintendo games. If you're watching Yacht Club games, you can take the idea, I promise not to see you. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like, subscribe and donate to my Patreon. I really need to pay off my alimony after I divorce my third wife. See ya. Oh, <laughs> oh,